I'll tell you two stories about two different people. One was Polish. When the war started, he was 14. And he joined what they in Poland called the Underground Army. He was too young to be in any kind of army at all. But he's stayed with them and on his 16th birthday plans had been made to rescue a group I think there must have been of politicians of some sort I'm not quite sure about that that were imprisoned there were Poles Jews for the most part uh, in the police barracks now we don't have police barracks here but they do on the continent the raid that they had that night was successful they managed to free the political prisoners that were in the barracks but knowing that the Gestapo would be hunting for them next day Julian Vietjech was his name he buried himself in a barn deep into the straw that was in the barn because the Gestapo the, or the, Ger the German e e soldiers they would fix their bayonets mm. onto their rifles and stab the bayonets into the straw knowing that that was a convenient place for people to hide in but Julian, and this was his 16th birthday by the way, I should have mentioned that. He was well and truly buried underneath so that the, bay the bayonets wouldn't reach him. But he was wakened the next morning by the farm dogs that were barking. Then he heard voices and he thought they were speaking in Russian. It would be better to be a prisoner in Russia than to be arrested by the Gestapo. So Julian came out of the straw that he was hiding in straight into the arms of a group of uh, oh, doesn't matter, a group of Ukrainians who were fighting for Germany and of course he was arrested taken to the Gestapo HQ he was stripped and he had to stand on the parade ground naked all day and all during the night and the rain was coming down I'm telling you this because this is a story as I was told it by Julian who is still incidentally alive This, as I said to you before, was his 16th birthday. There were then a group of them were walked from the eastern side of uh, Poland 
to Bergen-Belsen, which is in the western part of Germany. They walked the whole road. By the time we got there, believe it or not, it was his 18th birthday that day. He weighed five and a half stone. How heavy are you? Um, about ten stone. About? Ten. Ten. Ten stone. And about. He was five and a half stone. He was lying on the ground. The only thing he could move was his eyes. And fortunately, the medics who came after us, somebody saw his eyes moving and knew that he was still alive. But it took a whole year to get that 16 year old, now 18, back to some sort of fitness that would allow him to get home. Unknown to us, the night before we got there, The governor of the camp, a man called Joseph Kramer, and I'll show you a photograph of him in a minute or two, had ordered three trains of cattle trucks. Now, I don't know, you might not know what a cattle truck is like, but it's just a wooden shed on wheels. Three whole trains of cattle trucks were packed full of Jewish prisoners. In the middle, they placed a bucket. That was all. Men, women and children were packed into these cattle trucks standing. They couldn't sit down, they certainly couldn't lie, lie down until somebody maybe died and left a space. Then you could sit down. There were no windows, nobody knew where they were going. But the orders that night to the Gestapo who were on the train Take these trains to a bridge over a river and blow them up. Now, that is the order of a man who's going to be killed anyway. He, know, he knows he'll be he'll behind. But the hatred that was drummed into them, that the Jews were everything that was wicked, was such that he ordered these trains to be blown up. If only we had known we could maybe have been there the day before. I don't know. But I know one person who was on one of those trains. I should explain to you before I go, go on what, what this camp was like. 
you were in long huts, beds on each side, four tiers high, two to a bed. Every cot that was in there, and you'll see it in a minute or two, had two people in it. Now the other person that I still correspond with, who is there, was a, an 11 year old boy. His father had been in the army reserve and had been called up and was a prisoner. So he lived with his mother a brother and two sisters. The sister was a baby, not long born. The mother, they were Jews by the way, the mother had this terrible fear that they would be exposed. So she gave her baby away to a farmer and his wife to be brought up as their, their baby. What was that mother's thoughts when she had to give away this baby which was only weeks old into somebody else's care? because she knew that that would be the only way of saving any other family. If the farmer had been found out, he, his wife and the baby would all have been shot, just like that. No, no questions asked, no excuses taken. Shortly after she'd given the baby away, in the middle of the night there was a knock at the door. Now that is frightening in itself. It was more frightening because they were Jewish. The mother opened the door and there was a policeman and a, a Gestapo agent standing there. Don't move. You're coming as you are. Now remember they were in their night clothes. Why? We're going to the Gestapo headquarters panic for the mother because she, the two boys and the one sister. Now Jack was the eldest. He was 11. One of the neighbours had been arrested that day for doing something which I, I don't know what he did wrong but he was arrested by the Gestapo and he made a bargain with them that he would tell them where this Jewish family was if he could get off the charge that was levelled against them. So at 11 they were taken to Gestapo headquarters, questioned, 
and sent to Belton. 